Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn, and it is day two of Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoiler season. Uh, and we've got a ton of cards to go over today, so I don't want to stall too much getting to those cards. But I would like to ask if you could just hit that like button really quick. Uh, I know everybody asks to do it, but honestly, I put a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of time and energy into these videos, and it would mean a lot to me if we could get this video out to that many more people. Uh, and honestly, hitting the like button does help do that way more than you'd possibly think, <laughs> that you'd ever think. Uh, so just hit the like button, it takes two seconds. I would appreciate it so, so much. Also, if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. We've got so much more spoiler content on the way and a ton of cool deck techs are on the way as well. So lots of cool stuff for you to check out uh, and I would appreciate it greatly, honestly. Um, with that out of the way, let's let's get to these spoilers because man, we have so much to go over. First up, we have Lone Shark. One blue and three for a three four shark rogue. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast two or more spells this turn, you draw a card and it plots for one blue and three. Two important things I want to talk about with this. First of all, Lone Shark itself counts as a spell you cast. So you only actually need to cast one spell before Lone Shark. Uh, and when its ETB ability triggers, it's going to count itself as the second spell that you cast. Also, plotting it for 4 mana means that you can play it later for 0 mana, which means you can use all of your mana to play something much bigger and much more relevant and still play this for 0 mana afterwards and then still draw the card off of it. So because of those reasons, I think this is actually a little bit better than it looks uh, and it might actually make the cut in your limited deck, so keep it in mind. Next up, we've got Desperate Bloodseeker. That's right, vampires are coming back in a big way. We've got a 2-2 Life Linker here for one black and one. And when it enters the battlefield, target player mills two cards. Now, I want you to read that differently. Don't think of it as that. Think of it as when Desperate Bloodseeker enters the battlefield, commit a crime. Because committing a crime is actually a really important part uh, to this set, and there's a lot of cards that give you value off of committing crimes. What it means to commit a crime is if you target anything that belongs to the opponent or the opponent themselves, it counts as committing a crime. And like I said, there's just so many payoffs scattered around this set that being able to commit crimes is really important. So the fact that this guy just incidentally commits a crime uh, while you also get a 2-2 lifelinker for two is actually pretty good in this set and I think might be really relevant in limited Next up, we've got Thunder Lasso, and before we go over this card, I want to give a huge shout out to friend of the channel, Cfavretto Jr. Uh, Cfav is awesome, and he got this as a spoiler card given to him uh, by Wizards of the Coast, and we're super stoked for him. He's been grinding and working really, really hard, so him getting an opportunity like this to get his very own spoiler card is really, really awesome. We love you, Cfav. Congratulations on the card. We're just so stoked for you. This is Thunder Lasso, one white and two for an equipment. When it enters, you attach it to target creature you control automatically. That creature gets plus one, plus one. And whenever it attacks, you get to tap a creature defending player controls. It also equips for two. It's a little bit over costed. It's not the greatest ever, but it is some nice situational removal that can take their best creature out of, you know, out of contention for blocking every time you swing. Uh, I think whether or not this is good or how good this is is really dependent upon the cards that are in the format as a whole. Uh, if we have a lot of like go tall creatures and we're not going wide a bunch, then this gets a lot better and goes up in value. Whereas if the format contains a lot of token creatures, a lot of really low to the ground go wide creatures, uh, this is going to become less and less effective. So. We'll have to wait and see where, where the, the format lines up. Next up, we've got Arid Archway. This is a desert that taps for two colorless mana, which is kind of awesome. Uh, it also enters the battlefield tapped, which is not awesome, but it's expected. And when it enters the battlefield, two key things happen. You have to return a land you control to its owner's hand. And if another desert was returned this way, you surveil one. So some nice little extra value in potentially being able to surveil one there. Uh, but there's a couple ways this card could be used uh, to really great effect. First of all, any deck with Spelunking, 
This and all of your deserts are going to come into play untapped because of Spelunking. So if this can come into play untapped and immediately tap for two mana, it's almost like a Sol Ring, honestly. Which is kind of bananas. Also, if you can make it so that returning a land you control to its owner's hand ends up being beneficial to you rather than a drawback, it gets a little bit better too. You can do this with the legendary Kamigawa lands by returning them to your hand so that you can use them for their channel effects. You can also utilize this by like playing a landfall deck so that you can get landfall triggers off of the land that you return to your hand. Maybe you're out of lands to play on the next turn. Now you're going to have one. You're going to be able to get those landfall triggers. So there's some cool little situational ways in which you can make this card even better. Next up, we've got Tomb Trawler. This is a two mana zero four. You can pay two to put a card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. That's about it. <laughs> it's a decent blocker in the early game and it can go in any color deck so that's kind of good. Uh, it also makes sure your opponent can't beat you by milling you out which is fine but all in all it's not that great of a card. We're gonna move on to Cunning Coyote which is honestly kind of amazing and it pairs really well with another card that we're gonna talk about right after this. So this is a 2-2 Coyote with haste for one red and one when it enters the battlefield, another target creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains haste until end of turn. And you can plot it for one red and one. So the way plot works is you pay that plot cost, it goes into exile, and then on a different turn, it can't be the same turn, you can play it from exile at sorcery speed specifically for zero mana. And that's the part that makes it really great. So. I think a lot of the mono red stands are going to assume they just play this on two and swing, you know, they're just going to go for the throat, and I think that would be a mistake. You can get a lot of value off of that because you, you know, play a one drop on one, play this on two, and even though you're not utilizing the, the haste, you are still able to give your one drop the plus one plus one and get in for, an, you know, three extra damage on that turn two in addition to whatever the one drop was going to do originally. So. It's not the worst ever, it can be used effectively that way, but I think this guy is deceptively good with plot and gets way better if you're careful and you plan around how you're going to utilize the plot. And what I mean by that is you can plot him for two and even though you're not swinging in for that extra two or three damage on turn two, really you just want to make sure you're doing the most damage possible by the end of turn four, right? So it doesn't really matter if the 3 damage isn't happening then, as long as you can do more than 3 damage with this on a later turn, damage that you otherwise wouldn't have been doing. So if you plot this into exile, and then on turn 3 or turn 4, you're able to give a much bigger creature the plus 1 plus 1 in haste, and get in for a bunch of damage you otherwise wouldn't have been able to swing with that turn, uh, you can actually do a lot more damage overall, and have a better chance of just killing the opponent by turn four or turn five than you might have otherwise. And the other thing that I want to point out about plot that makes it so good that's going to be easily overlooked, but I think it's going to make the difference between the best players uh, and the worst players uh, and how they utilize these new cards. And I think it's something that people are going to start to realize slowly over time once this set is released is sometimes if you use plot to skip playing a creature on a specific turn so that you can double up or triple up on playing creatures all on one turn, it's going to really mess with your opponent's ability to curve out because sometimes, a lot of time, your opponent is holding up removal spells that they specifically want to use on specific turns, right? Maybe turn one, they've got cut down, they say go, and then... If you were on the play, you drop your second land, and they're expecting you to drop a two drop that they can kill. If you don't play it, that's kind of wasted potential. They didn't do anything with, with that one mana on turn one. And you can apply that same logic to some of the other removal spells they might be using that aren't cut down, maybe a two mana or three mana removal spell, right? So if on turn two, instead of playing this, you're plotting it, right? And now they don't have the option to kill a thing, and maybe that was their plan. They held up the mana specifically to do that. Uh, they might lose out on that tempo altogether. And then if you're just playing this for free and playing way more creatures than you other otherwise would be all on the same turn on a later turn, it's like too much all at once on one turn, and they can't deal with everything all at once. 
Whereas if you had played each creature on each turn, they could have killed each creature one at a time with the mana they had that turn. So in that way, sometimes you can just force a bunch of stuff onto the field that goes wider than your opponent can deal with and force them to have to leave a creature on the battlefield uh, that they can't get rid of when, when under normal circumstances they would have been able to get rid of it. So I know I rambled on a lot about that, but I think it's really, really important to note that kind of uh, play line that you can utilize with plot and to keep it in mind because I do think that that sort of thinking is what's going to separate some of the better players um, from some of the worst players. So keep that in mind. The next card pairs with this in interesting ways. This is Resilient Roadrunner. One red and one for a 2-2 haste as well. But this one has protection from coyotes. Are you seeing a theme? <laughs> you could also pay three mana to give it uh, unblockability by anything other than uh, creatures with haste. So it's basically the, the ginger brood ability. Uh, it is a little bit expensive, but it's also just kind of extra. I think the idea here is you're just swinging with haste and then maybe later in the game when you just need to swing for that last bit of damage, that's when you finally use the ability, right? They don't expect you to use this ability every combat. But in Limited in particular, having the ability to make this mostly unblockable is going to be super important. And the protection from Coyotes, I don't know how much that's going to matter, uh, but it can't hurt, that's for sure. Next up, we've got Mobile Homestead. Two mana for a 3-3 artifact vehicle. There's actually a vehicle in this. It's not just mounts. <laughs> uh, it has haste as long as you control a mount. And whenever Mobile Homestead attacks, you look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped, and it crews for two. So you can use your mounts to crew the vehicle, which has haste because of the mount, and then ramps you land. It does a lot. Uh, this is one of those cards I'm really going to have to see in action, probably in Limited to really wrap my head around how good it is. It's kind of weird, right? Are there any one mana mounts? If there are any one mana two power mounts that you can play on one and then play this on two and it has haste, that might be amazing. Uh, if it's gonna take a little bit more to get this going, I don't know how good it's gonna be, but I'm super interested to find out. Next up, we've got Shifting Grift. This is one of the cards that leaked uh, in a video that we covered it. Uh, we covered that in a video I want to say like two weeks ago, uh, but we'll go over it again here because it was officially released. Two blue mana for a sorcery, has spree, which means you have to choose one or more of these additional costs. For plus two mana, you exchange control of two target creatures, plus one exchange control of two target artifacts, and another plus one exchange control of two target enchantments. So in just the right deck, you can do some pretty wild stuff and just like take all their best stuff and give them all the worst stuff. For artifacts, you can give them like a blood token, right? For enchantments, you could give them a cursed roll token or something silly like that. Uh, and then obviously you could just give them like a crappy token creature and take their best creatures. So there's a lot of potential in this card, uh, but it's super dependent upon like what permanence your opponent is actually playing. So it'll be interesting to see how much of, a, of an impact this card actually makes. Next up, we've got Prosperity Tycoon. One white and three for a 4-2 human noble. When it enters the battlefield, you make a 1-1 one, one red mercenary token that can tap to give something plus one plus so at sorcery speed. You can also pay two and sack a token to give it indestructible until end of turn. If you do that, you have to tap it as part of the, the resolution. Uh, now, I think this card's actually really good in limited. In constructed, it's sort of a trap. It, it's like almost good in Constructed. Like, you want it to be good enough in Constructed, right? But I don't think it's quite there. But in Limited, being able to swing for 4 or potentially even 5 damage every single turn if you're also tapping your Mercenary, uh, with the ability to hold up this activated ability, uh, I think it's really good. You know, they can't really do much about it. If they block, you can sack a token to give it Indestructible. Uh, and just do that every turn as long as you can keep supplying tokens. But I think it's the threat of activation that can make this card good because they're not going to want to block knowing that you can give it indestructible. But then if they don't block it, you don't ever have to give it indestructible, right? 
So you can play some games with your opponent's head for sure. Uh, I think this is actually just going to be a pretty good card for white in limited. I really do. Next up, we've got Lassoed by the Law. Lots of mercenary tribal happening today. Uh, one white and three for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you exile a non-land permanent and opponent controls until Lassoed by the Law leaves the battlefield. So it's basically an O-ring, right? It's a little expensive, four instead of three. But when Lassoed by the Law enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token that can also tap to give something plus one plus O at sorcery speed. So even though this is a little expensive, probably too expensive to, to bother using in Constructed, in Limited, I think it's going to be great. Removal in Limited is great anyway, and this can hit literally any non-land permanent, which is a huge bonus. And providing a little bit of extra board presence and value tacked on is, is even better in Limited than it would be in any kind of constructed environment, and just really, really helps you take over the board, getting rid of their worst thing and getting a little dude to go with it. So I think this will be really good in Limited. Next up, we've got Fleeting Reflection. Don't know how I feel about this. One blue and one for an instant. You can give target creature hexproof uh, until end of turn and untap it. And it becomes a copy of up to one other target creature. So here's the thing. Two mana instant speed hexproof is fine. It's a little overrate. We're, we're used to getting, you know, one mana spells that can do that. But it is a thing that can save your dude. The problem is... Most of the time, if they're using removal on your creature, they're targeting your best creature anyway. So you're using this to save your best creature. And if you're saving your best creature, are you are you really going to want to turn that creature into a different creature until end of turn? Probably not. There's a chance you might want to turn it into their big thing if it's better than your big thing. <laughs> but uh, I think chances are it, this is more like a modal spell, right? It's like... You can either use it to get the Hexproof, or under different circumstances, you can use it to change one of your little dudes into a copy of something, you know, with a ton of value, something really huge, something that impacts the board, uh, and use it to, to generate value or close out the game or whatever. Uh, I think it's going to be very rare, though, that both of these abilities are relevant at the same time, but it is possible, so in that way, it's kind of interesting. Uh... I don't know, we're going to have to see how it goes. Next up, we've got Caught in the Crossfire. Uh, this is kind of like a, a sweeper. It's very similar to Brotherhood's End. Two red for an instant. It has spree, so you have to choose at least one of these additional costs. You can choose both. Uh, plus one mana, and it deals damage, uh, two damage to each outlaw creature, which are assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. Plus one mana, and it deals two damage to each non-outlaw creature. So this can do some pretty interesting things. At instant speed, you can pay three and basically pyroclasm all non-outlaws, which can be really good. Or if you happen to be up against an outlaw deck, you can just do it to all outlaws and not all of the other creatures. So in that way, sometimes it can be like a one-sided sweeper or semi-sweeper um, if you're able to use it just right. You could also just pay four mana and just do two damage to everything if you need to. Uh, and all of that is nice. It is it is a little a little expensive. It's definitely over-costed for that effect. But don't forget the fact that it has instant, right? It is an instant. So you can play it at instant speed, and that makes the value of it go way up because you can wait until combat, uh, choose your blockers carefully, and then play this to blow them out, you know, make sure your little guys trade for their bigger guys, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of versatility here. You could do that. You can choose to sweep one side or the other, outlaws or non-outlaws. Uh, and sometimes you might be playing creatures of one or the other so that you can sweep one or the other. Uh, I don't know how often that's going to line up, but the potential is there, which is really nice. Next up, we've got Congregation Griff, a three mana, one four flying lifelink hippogriff mount in the colors of Selesnya. That's pretty good as a defensive creature in limited already. Then it has saddle three, and if it attacks while it's saddled, it gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of mounts you control. So the thing I wanna mention about this is it's a really good defender. It pretty much blocks anything that has three power or less, even if it's in the air, and then also gives you an extra point of life 
to maybe help mitigate some of the damage that one of the other unblocked creatures they're attacking with is gonna do. So in that way, it's a really good defensive creature, but it's also kind of a nombo with itself in that you want to utilize its attack trigger, but it doesn't have vigilance. So the thing it seems best for is defense, but also you don't get to use the best part of the card unless you're attacking with it, since you can only saddle at sorcery speed. So that makes it a little weird. Uh, the one plus side here is the fact that it does count itself as a mount. So even if you have no other mounts on the field, you can saddle this for three and swing and get plus one plus one and swing in as a two five flying lifelinker which is pretty decent. Um, the other thing that makes this a little bit better than it looks is the fact that you can saddle with a creature you just played that has summoning sickness, even though that creature can't attack, which makes it really different than Enlist. Uh, with Enlist, you couldn't do that. So I, I kind of like this guy. I don't know where he fits best, but at the very least, a 1-4 flying lifelink blocker for three has got to be worth playing in Limited, right? Next up, we've got Rictus Robber. This is a 4-mana four 4-3 four, zombie rogue, uh, 1 black and 3. And when it enters the battlefield, if a creature died this turn, you get to make a 2-2 two, two zombie. You can also plot it for 1 black and 2, so the plot cost is actually less um, than, than the hard casting cost, which is really interesting. And I think the reason for that is it's so tempting to just slam this on four because you need to get board presence right you need to keep up with your opponent's tempo if you're playing limited and so they're rewarding you for thinking ahead and not being reliant on just having to slam everything to keep up with the opponent if you can think ahead and plot this it's only going to cost you the three mana to plot it put it into exile and then you can cast it for free on a key turn after you choose to make sure a creature dies right that way you make sure that you get the 2-2 so in that way this could be really good it's basically a three mana four three and two two um with the only stipulation being that it it's you know a suspended cast by one turn basically at least one turn um which makes it really interesting i actually think it's really good in limited at least next up we've got earth of joe frontier mentor uh this is agatha's soul cauldron's best friend <laughs> 2-4 Legendary Core Advisor for 4 mana in Boros. When it enters, it makes one of those 1-1 one, one Mercenaries that can tap to give a creature plus 1 plus 0 at sorcery speed. Uh, and whenever you activate an ability that targets a creature or player, you get to copy that ability, which is kind of bananas. Uh, if you're careful, you can brew this with Agatha's Soul Cauldron and just start to stack up activated abilities on the cauldron that you're just handing out to all of your creatures. And then all those active abilities, if they're the right kind of activated abilities that are, you know, targeting, uh, <laughs> you can double them all, which seems kind of awesome. Even in limited, I think this guy is worth playing. A 2-4 and a 1-1 one, one for 4 mana seems pretty decent by itself when you take into account the fact that at the very least, your mercenaries are going to be able to tap to give things plus 2, plus 0 oh, instead of plus 1, plus 0 oh, because of the double triggers. So... It'll be really interesting to see what kind of craziness we can brew around a card like this. Like I said, Agatha's Soul Cauldron's a really good contender uh, for being used with this card. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Next up, we've got Out Outcaster Greenblade. One green and two for a 1-2 human mercenary. When he enters the battlefield, you search your library for a basic land card or a desert, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. It gets plus one plus one for each desert you control. This guy reminds me a lot of the Gates deck back during the Ravnica sets when that was like a standard deck. Um, because you have these Gates cards that are dual lands that are coming into play tapped. So they kind of put you behind on tempo because you have to go really deep and only play those as your lands. But the trade-off is you have certain cards in that deck that just get so much better if you have a bunch of gates, right? And this is kind of similar. This, if if you're only playing deserts, at the very least, this comes out once you have your three mana as a four, five creature for three that also fetches another basic land or a desert, right? So it's, and then it's gonna grow from there. It's just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this could be a really huge threat for not very much mana at all 
in the right deck and the fact that it provides more value by fetching a land and that land can also pump it makes it really good but in limited it can also be really good because it can mana fix you so if there are other really good payoffs for deserts a desert deck in standard could be a real thing this card isn't enough by itself to be worth you know going into deserts and having that tempo loss of having to play tapped lands but if the, like i said if there are other good desert payoffs in a similar way to there were there were really good guild gate payoffs um we could really see the start of a new standard archetype here which i think would be really cool what's next next up we've got aloe alchemist one green and one for a three two trampling plant warlock uh, and when it becomes plotted, target creature gets plus three, plus two, uh, and trample until end of turn. You can plot for one green and one. This guy's awesome. He reminds me a lot of Mosswood Dread Knight. He's just a three, two trampler for two. Uh, but if you wait to play him as a creature and instead just pay the two to buff up your dude instead, you can play him as the creature for free on a later turn, which is just a ton of value. Getting to give plus three, plus two, and trample to your best creature um, and, and that, that ability is uncounterable as well, because you're not casting the spell, you're just plotting, you're just putting this into exile, and this ability is triggering, so it's not an actual spell that your opponent can counter, which is really interesting, so buff up your dude, uh, the only downside is it does have to be played at sorcery speed when you plot, so, um, it's just, it's, it's a really good card, I'm not 100% sure exactly what deck it wants to be in, but surely there's value here, right? Uh, it's also worth noting it's a plant, so it could slot into some sort of crazy new plant tribal deck with Insidious Roots. Uh, we're going to talk about another card way later in this video that is nuts with Insidious Roots and will absolutely fit into that deck. Uh, but a card like this, who knows? Insidious Roots buffs all your plants, and this will just keep getting counters from it if this is in the deck, so there's potential there. We'll see. Next up, we have At Knife Point. Three mana in the colors of Rakdos for an enchantment. As long as it's your turn, all of your outlaws get first strike. And whenever you commit a crime, you get to make a 1 1 mercenary that can tap to give any creature plus 1 plus 0 at sorcery speed. Now, these mercenaries that can tap to give buffs in conjunction with giving all your dudes first strike when you attack is kind of crazy. Because if you go wide with these mercenaries, you can use them to buff all of your attacking creatures just high enough that the first strike matters and that your opponent can't block and trade. Uh, so the two abilities in conjunction with each other are actually really good. So the fact that this spits out one of those creatures along with providing that first strike, I think this is going to be better than people realize. Uh, it, Outlaw's Tribal is just going to be really good, I think. This card's kind of bananas. Next up, we've got Congregation... Uh, Congre we already talked about Congregation Griff. Get out of here. Nobody likes you. Servant of the Stinger. One black and one for a 1-3 death touch human warlock. That alone is really good and limited. Maybe even good enough in the right standard deck. Probably not, but maybe. But a 1-3 death toucher for two can just trade with whatever you want to trade it can it can block and kill anything with two power or less and just stick around which is awesome its second ability really puts it over the top though whenever servant of the stinger deals combat damage to a player if you've committed a crime this turn you may sacrifice it and if you do you search your library for any card and put it into your hand and then shuffle there's some really cool ways you can use this right Obviously, you can just commit a crime when you know you're going to be able to swing through if they don't have any blockers, and then just, like, tutor up your bomb. The fact that this is an uncommon that will let you tutor up your bombs in Limited is bananas because Limited has be been becoming more and more bomb-heavy and more and more bomb-reliant, so if you can have another card in your deck that's going to help you get to your bomb that much quicker, that's going to be really good. But even in Constructed, I think this is crazy. You can do really cool things, like swing with this, and your opponent doesn't want to trade one of their relevant creatures, and if you haven't committed a crime yet, maybe they're like, eh, it's just one damage, he probably can't commit a crime, and they let it through. You can wait until after blockers and before damage is done, 
and then you can at instant speed do something that targets the opponent to commit a crime, and then go to damage, and you can sack this and tutor for your bomb. So there's some cool tricks you can do, it's a good blocker, uh, it's just a good card all around I think, and it's gonna be a pretty high pick and limited I'm pretty sure. Next up we've got Stubborn Burrow Fiend, 2 mana for a 2-2, two -two, 1 green and 1. It's a Badger Beast Mount, and whenever it becomes saddled for the first time each turn, you mill 2 cards, and then it gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. It also saddles for 2. So a 2-2 two -two for 2 is fine, and the fact that it can get buffed based on how many creatures are in your graveyard, it's just that buff, that amount that it can be buffed, is going to grow and grow and grow as the, time, uh, as the game goes on, assuming your stuff doesn't get exiled. Uh, and that's pretty cool. That makes this become a much more relevant threat as the game goes longer. But also, don't discount the fact that you can mill two cards. Sometimes that's going to matter. If you have a way to interact with your graveyard, or you just need to fill it up for other cards even, uh, there's a little bit of extra value there too, in addition to just helping put stuff in the yard to make the plus X plus X that much bigger. So, pretty cool little green card here. Next up we have Unscrupulous Contractor, one black and two for a 3-2 human assassin. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice a creature, you may sacrifice a creature, you don't have to, and when you do, target player draws two cards and loses two life. You can also plot it for one black and one. This is basically a strictly better Felstinger. If you guys remember Felstinger, uh, Felstinger from Innistrad, it was this exact same card, except it was a scorpion zombie instead of a human assassin. And I think both human and assassin are better creature types with more potential. But then also this just has plot. It's just strictly better in that it has plot. So you can pay three mana, put it aside, and then wait until a key turn where you have something you actually want to sacrifice. And then just play it for free. It doesn't take up your turn. You're still playing all of the other spells you would normally be wanting to play that turn. Because when you play from exile with plot, it's zero mana. So being able to do that especially before you draw the two cards so that all of your mana is left over to potentially play the things you draw into could actually be really, really good. So I think this card is a slam dunk. Next up, we have Emergent Haunting. One blue and one for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn and Emergent Haunting isn't a creature, it becomes a 3-3 spirit creature with flying in addition to its other types. You can also pay one blue and two and surveil one. Uh, I think this card is pretty good. It's, pot it's potentially possible to draft into an archetype where almost everything you're playing is either plot spells or flash spells. And in that way, you can plot things on your turn and then cast for free the things you plotted last turn, and none of that counts as actually casting a spell from your hand this turn. So this can just be a 3-3 flyer every turn, as long as you're super deep into that commitment and that archetype. If every turn you're just plotting or saving your mana to flash something in on your opponent's turn and you stick to that strictly, this is just going to be a 3-3 flyer every turn for just 2 mana, which is kind of good and could, could be enough to make this an archetype in limited. We'll have to wait and see. But having this mana sink where you can surveil one, uh, is nice gravy tacked on as well, so that even if you get to a point where you can't utilize the creature side of it, it's not sitting there and being completely useless. Next up we have Binding Negotiation. I kind of love this card. One black and one for a sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it, they have to discard it. If you don't choose a non-land card from it, you may put a face-up exiled card that they own into their graveyard. So, at the very least, you can make them discard any non-land from their hand for two mana here. Uh, but sometimes, they're going to plot something super relevant into exile, and then you can make them get rid of that card. And that's even better, because in that way, it's almost like a counterspell. What makes a counterspell good is, your opponent still has to pay the full amount of mana to cast the spell, and then you say no, it goes away, right? But they used up their mana, they don't, they don't get to cast anything else, they lose that tempo and they say go. With discard, you don't get that. You take something out of their hand so that they can't cast it, but they still have all of their mana available to cast something else. But with binding negotiation here, 
if they plot something and you make them put that in their graveyard, well, they've already spent a bunch of mana to plot that, and that's wasted tempo, right? That's that's mana they're never going to get back. It was going to be a free spell. Now it's just in the graveyard. So not only did you get rid of something relevant, but you forced them to kind of waste a turn paying the mana to play it. So I think this card's actually really, really good. Next up, we have Spinewood's Armadillo. Two green and four for a 7-7 seven, seven Armadillo with Reach and Ward 3. You can pay one green and one, discard Spinewood's Armadillo, search your library for a basic land card or a desert card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. You gain three life. So that discard ability is really, really good. <laughs> Two mana to search up any basic, but you can also find a desert if you want, and you gain the three life is going to be really, really good. It helps you to ramp. It helps you to mana fix your colors. Um, and then it has this big creature attached to it so that if you draw this card late enough in the game, you can just play it as a huge 7-7 seven, seven Reacher with Ward 3, and that's going to be great. But if you get this earlier where you don't have enough mana to do that, you can pad out your life total against aggro, find any land you want, and then continue to ramp a little bit more so that maybe if you draw into a second one, you then can hard cast it. Super cool. I think this is going to be overlooked as a really good card in Limited, so keep it in mind. Now we're on to the rares. And I need coffee, damn it. Coffee break! Coffee break. Coffee break. Coffee. Gotta appreciate a good cup of nectar. Alright, with that out of the way, Terror of the Peaks. Yes, this is the first card we have to talk about when it comes to the rares. They're reprinting Terror of the Peaks. Now, this is a good card to begin with. 5 mana, 5-4 five, flying dragon. Uh, your opponent has to pay 3 life anytime they try to target the damn thing. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of Peaks is going to deal damage equal to that creature's power to any target. You can use it as removal, you can use it as damage to the face, whatever you want. Now, this is already a great card, and it's super expensive to try and get a copy, which that part of it I'm kind of happy that they're reprinting this because it's going to be a little easier to get copies of this or for people that need it. But why did they reprint Terror of the Peaks in a set that has plot. I I am... <sighs> Look, Watsy. I don't know what you think people are going to do with this. But whatever you think people are going to do with this, I promise you it's not what people are actually going to do with this. You can just plot every creature from your hand on turn 2, on turn 3, on turn 4. And then you can slam the sky on turn 5... And it doesn't even matter that you don't have any mana left. You just play all of your plotted creatures for free. And all of them immediately trigger the Terror of the Peaks. That's disgusting. Even if they end up killing Terror of the Peaks, you're going to get so much damage and so much extra value off those triggers. I mean, it's possible you can just end the game outright there, right? Like, just do a bunch of damage to their head and just end the game. Uh, but even if you don't do that... You can nuke a bunch of creatures on their side, uh, and then just have a bunch of creatures in play that they can't possibly deal with all of them. It just seems crazy, man. Like, don't get me wrong, it's gonna be fun, and we're absolutely gonna brew that deck, so make sure you subscribe uh, if you're interested in seeing something like that, because we've got some spice. There's another card in this set that isn't included in this spoiler video, it's going to be in tomorrow's spoiler video because it came in a little too late and it's a card that needs to be translated, but it goes even harder with Terror of the Peaks and with that plot synergy. So uh, tune in tomorrow and we, when we get to that card on tomorrow's video, on the day three video, uh, I will remind you guys of Terror of the Peaks and we'll talk about it then because it's going to be nutty. But anyway, Terror of the Peaks is back. Yay! Next up we have High Noon. One white and one for an enchantment. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. You can also pay one red and four and sack it to deal five damage to any target. This card is bananas. <laughs> uh, you can play this in a counter spell deck, and if they can only play one spell a turn, you just counter it. 
right? And then you can still play a spell on your turn. And then just hold up a counter and counter it. No longer do you have to worry about them trying to, like, bait out your counter spell so that they can use the rest of their mana to play something else. Like, they can only play one spell a turn. And that in and of itself is nutty. But you can also play this with flash creatures. That way, maybe your opponent can only really put board presence on the board on their turn. They don't have anything with flash, but you can flash stuff into play on their turn and play a spell on your turn. So maybe you can still play two every turn cycle, and maybe your opponent can only play one, other than maybe a few instant speed removal or something. And in that way, you can take take advantage of this. But then the fact that you can sacrifice this to deal five, not only is this like backup removal, like panic button removal, oh no, a thing I have to kill. It can even kill Shieldred, but you could just drag out the game and then eventually when they get to five life, just sack it to kill them. Uh, by then, maybe you even have a second copy of High Noon and you can just sack them both to kill them. And it's worth noting, this also helps you deal with the fact that you can't cast more than one spell each turn because you can sacrifice it to get it off the board doing five damage to something and then play a second spell if you have enough mana to do all that. So I think there's a lot of ways that this card's really good that are going to get overlooked at first glance. Uh, and I'm super excited to brew with it, honestly. Next up, we've got Bruise Tarl, Roving Rancher. Four mana in the colors of Boros for a 4-3 legendary human warrior. Uh, oxen you control have double strike. Interesting. And when he enters the battlefield or attacks, you exile the top card of your library. If it's a non-land, you can play it until the end of your next turn. If it's a land, you create a 2-2 white ox creature token. Which will have double strike because of Bruce Tarl's static ability. So... You're creating 2-2 double striking oxes every time he swings, or you're just getting a spell to play. Either way. Uh, I wonder if there are enough other oxes to make him even better. Uh, if we see some really good ox creatures that we can play, especially turn 2 or turn 3, and then follow that up by slamming this on 4, so that not only do we have all the baked in value that comes with this guy, but we're also immediately giving those oxes double strike when they attack that turn, that could be wild, and that could actually make an ox tribal deck real. Uh, it really depends on what kind of support, what other oxes we have, but the idea has merit and it's super interesting. We'll see if it happens. Next up, we have Riku of Many Paths. This is three mana in the colors of Teemer for a 3-3 legendary human wizard. And it's got an interesting ability. Whenever you cast a modal spell, you choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. So if you're able to pick all three modes of a spell that has three modes, you can actually trigger each of these three abilities. But if you can only pick one mode on a modal spell, you get to choose one of these. One of them is exiling the top card of your library, and you can play it until the end of your next turn. One is putting a plus one, plus one counter on Riku and giving him trample until end of turn. And then the last one is creating a 1-1 one, one flying bird creature token. So there's just a lot of value you can have with this guy. Like, you can play it with charms, you can play it with commands. Like, all of those older cards can make great use of a card like this, and you can get some really cool versatility in you get your choice of modes with a charm, and then you also get your choice of modes on this, and you can pair up certain modes on a charm with certain triggers on this to get some really interesting results. But obviously, where it's going to work best is with uh, the Spree cards that are included, included in this set, because the Spree cards allow you to potentially choose all three of the modes if you can play enough, pay enough mana. So the ability to get all three of these triggers off of one Spree spell is really cool, and it really makes me wonder what the cheapest Spree spell with the cheapest extra cost, like what that total mana number will end up being. It'll be interesting to see by the time the entire set is spoiled which of those cards ends up being the cheapest way to trigger all three of these. Um, really interesting. Really, really interesting. Next up, we have Bonnie Paul, Clear Cutter. Here's those oxes we were talking about. <laughs> A 6-5 legendary giant scout with reach for six mana in the colors of Simic. When Bonnie Paul enters the battlefield, you create Bo. Oh, Bo's the name of one of my puppers. Bo's a legendary blue ox creature token. 
With this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. So at the very least, it's going to be a 6-6, six, six, and it's going to get bigger over time. But also, whenever you attack, you draw a card, and then you may put a land card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. The important thing to note about that is it's not when Bonnie attacks. It's just when you attack with anything, right? So getting to draw a card every turn and ramp out potentially a land every turn off of just attacking with whatever creature is going to be best to attack with is kind of bananas while still holding up a 6-5 Reacher and having a giant Ox that's just going to get bigger with time. And if you can somehow play this in 4 or 5 color with, you know, Bruise, it's going to get double strike too, which is kind of bananas. Uh, I don't know how reasonable that is at 4 colors, but it's it's there. It's a possibility, right? Uh, I think this is pretty cool. It is expensive, but at the same time, it's in colors meant to be ramping, right? And in that way, it's kind of hard to gauge how good this is and if it's good enough specifically in Constructed. Obviously, in Limited, this is just going to be a bomb. Next up, we have Marchesa, Dealer of Death. A 3-4 legendary human rogue for 3 mana in the colors of Grixis. Honestly, I love that they're just bringing Marchesa here or uh, just Fiora, the plane of Fiora in general, into the story more. Uh, we got a card, uh, be, I believe an invasion card, a battle, uh, back during March of the Machine, which was really cool. And now we have Marchesa herself here. I'm hoping we return to Fiora soon. We'll see. Whenever you commit a crime, you may pay one. And if you do, look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. This ability is deceptively good. Like, it's it's way better than it appears on the surface, right? Every time you use a removal spell on your opponent's creature, which you're going to be doing anyway, it will count as committing a crime. You just pay one, get the best of the top two cards in your hand, and maybe the other one actually gives you value by being in the graveyard. So... You could just play this with all the normal best removal spells you would normally be playing anyway in like a Grixis control deck and just get crazy value every single time you kill something. And that's good enough on its on its own. But the fact that you can also put something in the graveyard means maybe this makes the cut in Reanimator as well. Maybe you can play Reanimator in a way where early on you are reanimating their stuff so that it counts as committing a crime with things like Cruelty of Gix or whatever. Uh, and then using that to, to put stuff in your graveyard with Marchesa's ability so that eventually you can cast another reanimator spell on some big nasty bomb that you self-milled into your own graveyard. So, I don't know. There's a lot of potential for a card like this, but it is way more value than you realize. So keep it in mind because it's going to be pretty wild. Next up, we have three steps ahead. Speaking of value, this is a... Uh, blue instant for just one blue mana, but it's a spree card, so you have to choose at least one of these additional costs. For a total of two blue and one, you can counter target spell. Uh, for an extra three mana, you can create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control. For an extra two mana, you can draw two cards and then discard a card. This is awesome, because on the floor, at the very least, it's a reasonably on-rate counterspell. Like, 3 mana to counter a spell, at the very least, that's what it's going to do. And if that's all it, all it does, that's probably okay. But the fact that it has this upside of potentially being able to do way more makes this card kind of nutty. And at instant speed, like, just paying the 4 mana to make a token that's a copy of the best artifact or creature you control, a token that sticks around forever, could also be really, really nuts in and of itself. Uh, I, f I feel like if you can counter a spell and make a copy of something, that's where this thing really starts to shine. That's going to cost a total of six mana, but it's going to get you a lot of value if you can do it. I just love that you have versatility here, but you also have the ability to, if it's just really late in the game and you have tons of mana, and you end up drawing into another copy of this, you can just pay all the mana ever and just get all the value. Uh, so the fact that it has the ability to turn that on later in the game makes a card like this just super, super good. So I'm excited about it. Next up, we have Vadmir New Blood. Uh, more Vampire Tribal, also Outlaw Tribal here being a rogue. It's a 2-2 legendary creature for one black and one. And whenever you commit a crime, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on him. But this ability triggers only once each turn. 
Uh, as long as Vadmir has four or more plus one plus one counters on it, it has Menace and Lifelink. So this can get really big really quick and turn into a giant Menace Lifelinking creature. And I think it's really easy to look at that limit of once a turn and really like discount this card, not realize how good it is because of that. Because even though it's a it's limited to once a turn, uh, you can still activate it on your opponent's turn as well. So if you have like a sorcery speed removal spell and an instant speed removal spell and enough mana to cast both, you don't need to cast them both on your turn and commit a crime twice on your turn. So it doesn't matter that the ability only triggers once a turn. You cast a sorcery speed removal, kill their dude, say go, and then on their turn, use the other instant speed removal, a cutdown or whatever, to kill something else. And then you get a plus one plus one counter on your turn, a plus one plus one counter on their turn. By the time you're ready to swing with this again, it's a 4-4, and if you commit a crime before swinging with it, it could be a 5-5, which is crazy. It can very, very quickly become a 6-6 menace lifelink, before your opponent even realize what the hell is happening. So I think this is better than it looks. On the surface, it seems like it's gonna take too long and it's just gonna die to removal. Um, but if you force your opponent to use removal on, on, on your two drop, that's not necessarily a bad thing because your three, four, five drop creatures are probably much, much more valuable and they're gonna run out of removal eventually, right? Next up, we have Step Between Worlds. Time Twister, how I miss you. This is two blue mana and three colorless for a sorcery. Each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who does gets to draw seven cards and then you exile step between worlds. It can also be plotted for two blue and four, which is more mana than it costs to hard cast it. And there's a good reason for that. But before we talk about that, <sighs> story time, I used to have a time twister. And then quarantine happened during COVID, and I was always a concert promoter. I still kind of am. And that was my primary career, and I couldn't put on concerts during quarantine. I couldn't host them. So I didn't know when quarantine was going to end. I thought I was just on vacation. So that's when I started streaming. <laughs> and uh, I don't regret it at all because I love doing this with all of you guys, but... Uh, I didn't know how long it was going to drag on, and it dragged on so long that things got really tight uh, before I could finally get back to putting on concerts. So I ended up having to sell my Time Twister. I think I sold it for like $2,200 or $2,400 at the time, and since then it's at least doubled in how much it would have gone for. So I'm a sad panda. I'm not going to ramble on anymore about it because I know you guys are just excited about the spoilers, but... I just wanted to share that because Time Twister has a special place in my heart. Maybe some other time I will let you guys know how I got that Time Twister, which is an even crazier story, but that's a story for another day. Anyway, this card is rad, and the reason you want to plot it is because if you plot it even though it's more mana, the turn you cast it, you're casting it for free, and you're holding up all of your mana to use with the seven cards you end up drawing from this. But the way to really break this card is to play it with Shieldred. Because if you have a Shieldred out before you play this, what is your opponent going to do? They can't choose to shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library and draw 7 without losing 14 life. So sometimes Shieldred just forces this to be a one-sided time twister so that you get to redraw 7, your opponent gets nothing if you have your Shieldred in play. And because you can plot this, you can actually set up a situation where, if your opponent's tapped out, you slam Shieldred, and because they have no mana to deal with it right away, if this is in exile ready to, be, ready to be played because of plot, you can still play this for zero mana on the same turn you played your Shieldred, when normally you wouldn't have enough mana for that, and now you force them to be in that position. They don't even get the option of untapping and dealing with the Shieldred first, so there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this card, and I'm pretty excited that we have a Time Twister variant. I don't know how competitive it's going to be. We're really going to have to wait and see. But I'm excited that the potential is there. This card is kind of bananas. Next up, we have Outcast Trailblazer. This is 1 green and 2 for a 4-2 human druid. When it enters the battlefield, you add 1 mana of any color. And whenever another creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield, under your control, you get to draw a card. 
This is kind of insane. If you just hard cast this guy, he's basically a 4-2 for two, 2 because he gives you mana back. But he also gives you mana of any color, uh, which is also pretty good because it can help fix you the turn that you cast it, right? And then you have this static ability that's just going to draw you cards over time unless they deal with this dude. But if you're in a deck that's playing power 4 or greater creatures, all of your other creatures are probably going to be a much bigger threat than this. So if they have to waste one of their removal spells on this, and then they don't have an extra removal spell to use on, you know, a big thing later on in the game, that's going to hurt. But where this gets really crazy is if you plot it for one green and two, you can actually use that mana it generates as kind of crazy ramp because you plot this on turn three. On turn four, you're playing it for zero and still getting a mana back, which means on turn four, even without any other ramping, you can have access to five mana, still have your four two on the field, have all five mana ready to cast a five drop, and then that five drop can come into play and draw a card off of the Trailblazers. So you can set up some really gnar gnarly situations. And again, you have the benefit of plot that I pointed out earlier in this video, where if you're playing multiple creatures on the same turn, but skipping a turn playing a creature, maybe it messes with your opponent's curve, and now, now they're not able to kill one of the creatures when otherwise they could. So you can set up some really interesting play lines where you force a ton of value all on one turn, and this guy's even letting you draw a card, right? So, absolutely bananas card. Definitely one that's gonna be a lot better than I think people realize at first glance. Next up, we have Avon Interrupter. Speaking of insane cards, three mana for a 2-2 Flash Flying, which is kind of okay by itself, but then when it enters the battlefield, you get to exile any spell that's on the stack, and that spell becomes plotted. Spells your opponents cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. So not only does that thing that you just exiled and force them to plot uh, require them to actually pay two mana when they eventually cast it, but because it's plotted, plotted cards can only be cast on a different turn. So they cannot immediately recast it that turn. They have to wait an entire turn cycle because they can also only play plotted cards at sorcery speed. So even if the thing that you hit is an instant, they're not going to be able to wait till your turn and cast it. They have to wait until their next turn and then they can finally cast it for free, which isn't free. It's two because of the static ability. But then it gets even crazier because this static ability applies to everything that gets, gets cast from graveyards or exile. Which means if you're up against a deck that's trying to do that with like discover cards, with uh, PNLR style value, with Quintorius Cond, all that kind of stuff, this shuts that down in huge ways because all of that takes an extra two mana. Heck, even just playing an adventure creature from exile is going to cost them two mana. So this just does a ton. But it doesn't end there, because you can also play this in response to a counterspell, exile the counterspell, and now that counterspell is effectively completely useless, because they can only cast it at sorcery speed, and what good is a counterspell being cast at sorcery speed? So it effectively completely counterspells their counterspell forever, which is also insane. But even crazier than that, Sometimes you can use this on your own spells. If you play an adventure creature or an adventure permanent that has a very cheap adventure, but a very expensive permanent, you can flash this in, target the spell while it's on the stack, and then the whole card gets exiled and can be, uh, and gets plotted and can be played. So the next turn cycle comes around and you get to play the big side of that adventure creature or adventure permanent for free. Like, Virtue of Persistence. If you Virtue of Persistence something for two mana on turn five, and you have the three mana to flash this in, well now, on your next turn, you just get to cast a free seven mana enchantment Virtue of Persistence, which can also be kinda nutty, while still having a 2-2 flyer here that still makes your opponent's stuff cost more from Exile and Graveyards. There's just so much you can do with this guy. And I don't think anyone's truly grasped just how crazy it's going to be. We're absolutely going to brew with it right away when the set launches. And it's going to be nuts. I have a flash deck that's this is just going to be perfect in. It's going to be bananas, guys. And the last card of the day is Bristly Bill Spine Sower. Get ready, guys, because Insidious Roots 
just got crazier. One green and one for a 2-2 legendary plant druid. It has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. That's pretty decent in and of itself, and it could see play in certain ramp or landfall decks just because of that ability. But then it has this activated ability where you can pay two green and three and double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. Think about this guy in Insidious Roots. Like, first of all, every time Insidious Roots goes off, it puts a plus one plus one counter on all plants, which means Bristly Bill is gonna get a counter as well. He's gonna get super huge, super quick because of your Insidious Roots. But then all of your Insidious Roots guys are tapping for mana too. So you can very, very quickly get to your 5 and maybe even 10 mana to activate this once or even twice super quickly because of how much you get to ramp with your plants that can now make mana with Insidious Roots. And being able to double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control means all those plant tokens are doubling their counters or maybe quadrupling if you can activate this twice. Bristly Bill's doubling the number of plus one plus one counters on it. If you have any other creatures uh, on the battlefield that have counters, those are going to get bigger too. So this is just nuts. Uh, it works with Willow Geist in that deck too because Willow Geist gets counters. I just... Insidious Roots is about to get even more gross and I'm super super excited about it we're gonna brew that right away we need to make sure and jump on that deck before all the other content creators uh do it because it's gonna be bananas it's gonna be absolutely bananas this is crazy this card is crazy do you agree with me let me know in the comments below because i think this set is turning out to be whoo one heck of a set but that's all the spoilers for today I'm going to link up above and down below a link to our spoiler shorts so that you can keep up to date on new spoilers that come out after this video uh, before we get to the point where we have time to make another full length video. I'm putting out spoiler shorts all day long that are detailing like new cards right as they're being announced. So check out that if you're interested. Like I said, I'm going to link that up above and down below again so you can make sure to check it out. And with all of that out of the way, Thank you so much for checking out the video. I do appreciate it. Like I said at the beginning, like the video if you wouldn't mind because it really does help so much to get this video out to so many people. And I put so much work into this thing that I, I would really appreciate it if we can get more eyes on it. So thank you so much. Subscribe if you want to see more because so much more is on the way. And I'll see you guys next time. Until then, always make them scoop. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there and if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately that's somewhere up that way also subscribe circle below do all the things